Welcome, everybody. This is the Life Enthusiast Online Radio and TV Network, restoring vitality to you and the planet. I'm your co-host and executive producer, Scott Patton, and joining us as usual is the health coach at Life Enthusiast and the founder of Life Enthusiast, Martin Patella. Hey, Martin, how are you doing today? It's good. I'm getting very philosophical. I have had some really interesting, I would call them setbacks, you know, like opportunity for growth. And I'm thinking, all right, how does this really work? Wisdom. How do I gain wisdom? I gain wisdom from making a dumbass decision that I get to learn from and be smarter for the next time around. So so the, what, what's coming to my mind is, oh, for me to get smarter or wiser, maybe, I actually need to be stupid. I need to make dumbass decisions so that I may learn from them. And then as long as I have the level of perception to learn, I'm actually able to get better, move forward, grow. Anyway, that, that's my side of the deal. I know a friend of mine that would say uh, that's why we have coaches to uh, – give us some of their wisdom so that when we're about to make a dumbass decision, that they can short circuit it and we don't have to go through the pain. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, there's a number of different ways of looking at that. And obviously, if you're not making any mistakes and you're not doing anything that's a dumbass decision, then you're not doing anything, right? And so an example of that would be when I ran grocery stores and I would go to a new store and the first thing that happened was the employees that were really stuck in a rut would come and talk to me because they for five years have filled the dairy and they're afraid that I'm going to move them out of the dairy somewhere else because I represent change and the last thing they want is change. And it's not for me to judge their life and their decision to be the dairyman for the rest of their lives, but I know that if you're 25 and you're throwing around crates of dairy, that's a big difference than if you're 55 and throwing around crates of dairy. So I know that that person's decision long term is going to be a very poor one. And you just have to go into any grocery store and look at the people that have been there for 20 years to see how broken they are. And I think that's applicable to most industries where you just you get in, you kind of do your job and it's you get stuck in this rut. And the only, you know, and and that if that's your decision and it's a conscious decision, and you've talked to your significant other and your kids, and everybody agrees, it's okay, Dad. Well, I'm talking about a male in my case. You know, you can be a store manager for the rest of your life, and at 55, when you have your heart attack, you know, we'll all cry at your, at your funeral, but, you know, we know that you were doing what you decided you wanted to do. And to me, that's, is there a worse decision to may, be made than that? I, I can't think of one, because we should be living to... 90 years old in very, very good health, if not 100, to be able to enjoy our grandkids and our great grandkids and everything else. And uh, there's been a lot of people uh, recently who are in the entertainment industry who have passed away. Leonard Cohen uh, it comes to mind and a few others, and they were not particularly old. And so, uh, you know, there are thousands of people, millions of people, you know, miss them. And I just think, you know, if they'd have made some more conscious decisions about their lifestyle, particularly when they were probably abusing it, uh, they would have had a longer and more fulfilling life. Could be. I mean, Leonard, I don't know. He was 82 and he uh, had had cancer previously and it came back and uh, or it never left. And um, anyway, I but I hear you about the, the decision. I, I'm aware of some people being needing change like somebody's good on a job for a year year and a half at the most and then they need to move on others maybe four or five years somebody else oh they just they're happy to do the job they started and keep doing it till the day they die yeah well 30 years ago you, the expectation was you'd be 40 years with one company you'd get a golden handshake and a nice pension and you'd be fine yeah, pension, huh? Pension, yes. <laughs> that non-existent thing. Good concept that works for government employees, maybe. That's right. So one of the reasons why all this came up is I happen to be in the tropics in Cancun. And 
last week I was in Colombia in a two-story penthouse, which, you know, because you may think that's an expensive thing, it was $35 a night. <laughs> it was an eight-bedroom penthouse and, uh, you know, very expensive, very gorgeous and very beautiful. And, and I just fell into that opportunity and I took it. And one of the things that I've wanted to do in my life is to be able to be location independent because I love to travel, I love to explore new cultures and, and see different places. And, and so now that I am an empty nester, that opportunity has arose and, and I've moved towards it. And the interesting thing for me about this whole situation that I'm in was about eight months ago, I was talking to a, a lady that I had dated in 2003, 4, 5 and was telling her what I was doing and she said, oh Scott, I'm so happy for you. You're, you're finally achieving your dream. And I said, what? Oh, you were talking about doing this when we were going out. And it's just so wonderful to see that you know, the, you've gone through this process and now you're able to do what it is you said you wanted to do. And there was a couple things I got out of that. One was, because we want to do something and we live in what I call the McDonald's society, we think that, oh, I want to go to Hawaii and then you're disappointed tomorrow because you wake up and you're not in Hawaii. And that's not the way it works. It takes time for our dreams to manifest in this world. And, uh, and the other thing was, was that when we're talking about things, even if you don't remember that you're talking about them, because I didn't, uh, you're putting into motion forces that will bring you towards what it is you want. And the scary part of that for me was as I went through the last part of this process, which was helping my son buy a house, helping my son move into the house, and then letting go of where I had lived for the last 10 years, if I can put it this way, the universe was kicking me in the pants to get me to go because I was resisting change. And I think resisting change is a normal thing. I was petrified. I didn't know what would happen. I didn't know what it would be like. I, there were all these unknowns because anywhere you, time you have a change, it's unknown. And, uh, and so as I was sort of resisting it, like, no, 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 I don't think so. You know, these things were happening that were just pushing me exactly the way I wanted to go. It's just, it was very, very funny. So you have to be prepared for the fact that you may get what you want and it may scare the bejeebies out of you. <laughs> yeah, the fledgling little bird, barely yeah. capable of supporting his weight with his wings, going to get kicked and... Mama Eagle just bam and down you go and you're just flapping like crazy. Yes. Yeah. So this brings us to, you know, what our mission is, which is restoring vitality to you and to the planet. And some of the frustrations that come to us is that we know that if you ate better, if you drank clean water, if you detoxified yourself, if you got out, off your ass and away from the TV and actually walked around the block a couple times, all these things would improve the quality of your life, yet so many people go to their doctor. And the doctor says, oh, take this pill, you'll be fine. And they take the pill, and whatever was causing the problem, may, they don't feel that anymore because something worse happened. And they put on 50 pounds, or they've got aches where they had no aches, or it just goes on and on and on. Yeah, I'd like to butt in here with this, this pill for the ill, right, where the, the the method used by the mainstream medicine is the reductionist thinking. Not holistic, not integral, but reductionist, meaning that they see the body as a sum of discrete parts that work separate from each other. And likewise, they see the life and the existence and your general being as, as sum of pieces that are discrete, that are separate, that you can treat individually instead of together and see them holistically. Uh, I guess I'll liken it to a football game. You want to win the championship game? Which of your players is important? Like you come to the doctor and you say, my game is not going well. I think my quarterback is not well. And he says, well, I have, I have a fix for your game. I'll give you a better quarterback. Or I'll give you, you can't feel your quarterback. And... So you may be losing your game, but you don't care because you're not noticing that you're losing your game. So, so the, the point that you were making about taking the drug, the drug typically removes a symptom or suppresses a symptom. 
which is the equivalent of uh, putting earplugs in your ears or, or um, I don't know, something over your eyes so you don't see. Right. When it comes to the life enthusiast approach to life, we always try to bring it back to the whole thing. The integral, everything connects with everything. If you're doing it in one place, you're doing it in all places. So if you're uh, ignoring, you, you cannot ignore the signals that life is sending you. Or you do it at your peril. Exactly. You know, and the result, like, as you know, Martin, and, and maybe some of the people watching this know, is I had a life-threatening situation a couple of years ago, and I was four to six weeks in the hospital. I still can't figure out how many weeks I was in the hospital. Just It's just blurred. Going, moving up to the crisis period, there were lots of, by the way, Scott, there's something wrong, there's something wrong, there's something wrong. And when I actually did go to see the, the doctor, the doctor sent me to the emergency, to the hospital. They kept me overnight. Three days later, they had made an appointment with a liver specialist. I saw the liver specialist. He looked at everything and he said, well, come back in a month and we'll see where you are. And a week to 10 days later, I was in the hospital pretty much on my deathbed. So even though there were uh, symptoms, even though there were clues, there was nobody prepared to take any action. I mean I, I mean, I took the only action at that time that I knew, which was go to the doctor, because obviously I'm yellow and things are not right and I'm feeling bad. But the doctors were like, you're, and we talk about this a lot, they're great at emergencies, they're not so great when it's not an emergency. And at that particular time that I went, the first time, it was not, according to them, an emergency. So the result was go home, drink lots of fluids, get lots of rest, see us in a month. My body's going, well, you know, we don't really have a month. We're pretty much done now. And a week later, I'm back in the, I'm back in the hospital. So uh, they got me through it, thank God, and I'm still here. But I, I just, I keep remembering that you're not sick enough yet for us to really pay too much attention to you. And that's the problem with the emergency uh, li lifestyle, the emergency mindset of our our system it's like ah yeah like you know there's a lot of people that are worse off than you and i need to deal with them so see you later come back when you're bad which is like should not be the case it should be you know what we need to support your liver we need to support your pancreas we need to support your kidneys so that you can not go to emergency again yeah this is an interesting point is managing the slow but steady decline from good to less good and so on until you're ready to die. And it's it's almost set up for us as if we were supposed to expect loss of function. Like, you know, you're great. You can compete at the professional athlete level in your 20s. And in your 30s, you can no longer do it because... Um, you're in your 30s. You're in your 30s. And yet, there they are, some of the athletes are keeping it going, mm -hmm. even into their 40s. What's different here, right? And uh, I think I know at least part of it is enzymes. So long as you maintain the enzyme and hormone level of the youth, your body will continue to function at the performance level of the youth. Right. And so I'm, I'm supplementing with enzymes. I've en encouraged you to do the same. And, and sure I am. And sure enough, when you do, you feel a whole lot better. Yes. And the gray starts to disappear in your hair, too. I was just talking with a friend of mine today, and I said, I think my hair is getting darker. And she goes, yeah, it's definitely a lot darker than it was a year ago. Crazy. Yeah. Insane. Unfortunately, mine is not. I'm, <laughs> a, I'm much more damaged than you are, and uh, or in different ways, right? Yes. Now, having said that, you've got way nicer and way more hair than I have. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> nice and white. <laughs> but anyway, the point being is that I was looking at a show, uh, you know, an educational seminar. I spend two hours every day uh, trying to pump my head full of new things. And uh, anyway, there they are, 
describing this particular style of an eyelid, you look at this, or you look at this. See, this is this sort of a hanging down upper eyelid, right? Okay. And uh, that's associated with the MTHFR genetic mutation, the undermethylation challenge. It's it's a genetic thing you you inherited from your parents, and when you have it, you're undermethylate, which means that your ability to convert food into energy is lesser, and to detoxify at the cellular level is lesser. Oh, okay. So you know, so I start off with a, a governor on my engine. I can't go as fast as other people or as long as other people because my reserves are shallower. I got it. Yet, I'm able to do just fine at least within the parameters because I at least take care of the rest, except for that episode with mercury poisoning. Right. That really set it all on its ear. But anyway, so that there we are, learning, right? Learning from life. <sighs> hmm. What would I like to say about that? I would like to help people who are wanting to have a better life. We do have the tools. We have them. We've worked for decades getting the tools back into the cupboard. I'm not in front of my cupboard. I wish I had the computer set up right in front of it. I'd show it to you. There are things in it. There are things in my freezer and in my cupboard that help me maintain a decent level of function. Way better than you would expect um, from a person in my age group or whatever else standing. And I want to talk to people about what that is, how they can have more of life uh, no matter what age. So what you're saying is that there's hope. We don't have to wait until we're in an emergency situation where they, and the, and the sad part of it, by the way, in my case of being in the emergency situation was after five or six weeks of laying in a bed, 30% of your, my muscle mass was gone. So I had to build all of that back up. Two years later, because I'm 60, uh, it's still taking, I'm still building that up. And there are still consequences of that, of that visit that I'm still working on cleaning up and because it was kind of like they just flooded the body and to put out the fire and with and once you flooded a valley you know you ruined a lot of things right all the little plants and everything else are all drowned out trees are drowned out and the topsoil is all swooshed away and it's going to take a long time for the valley to get back and that's one of the things that I recognized was I'm I've you know, I'm, I'm at this level, now I'm at this level, now to get back up, I need to do a lot of work and a lot of effort. And so that's walking a lot, that's doing my uh, yoga, that's detoxifying, that's taking the uh, the enzymes, that's making sure that I don't eat uh, the black forest cakes that I used to eat in my 20s. And, oh, you know, I mean, there's all these things. And the, But the biggest part of it is the determination and the persistence, because I have a friend who told me that her mom in the 50s was running around mountaintops and climbing and hiking. And then now when I see her in her like 80s, she looks like a decrepit old lady and she walks at about a foot an hour speed, right? And I thought, I don't want to have that. And that's the what happens, right? Because if you don't work at it and you just sort of try to do everything the way you did before when you were healthy, you don't come back. You need to put in that effort to get back to where you are, which means extra enzymes, which means walking up the flight of stairs instead of taking the elevator. It means, you know, walking across the street instead of taking a taxi cab or, you know, it's, it's putting in the effort to do the physical exercise to make sure you're eating. In my case, I moved to organics. I took out, you know, the carbs, you know, like, and starches like potatoes and bread and pasta as much as I could still have a little bit of bread. And, uh, and I made all these changes because I know if you don't make those changes, it's a slow, steady decline. Right. And so we have the tools. We have the metabolic typing evaluation tools, which we can uh, employ, get you to use so that we know what to feed you and why. And we can recommend the right sort of foods. And we have professional therapeutic grade products. It's not enough to say, oh, eat more greens. 
you can't go into a store and pick up the bottle of the greens for $30 and think that that's going to work every bit as well as the bottle that costs 45 that we make. And the point is that you need to have certain level of quality or else it's not going to do the job. Right. Yeah, so what you're really talking about here, Martin, is we're going against societal norms because our society is full of Walmarts, Costco's, McDonald's, and subsidized corn and soy and uh, cotton and those sort of things. So what happens is we made a decision in the 50s that we were going to feed North America and it was not going to cost very much. And the result was a level of food quality that was poor even though there was millions and billions of dollars being spent, uh, the, the end result was not a very good, ha, isn't a very good result. You just have to look at heart attacks, cancers, obesity, to see that we're filling people up with lots of calories and very little nutrition. And the result of all that, of course, is all these health problems that people have. And so if you've grown up thinking that going to Costco and buying you know cases of corn beef or something or or you know <laughs> spam is the, is the answer uh, and then you've got the tvs telling you you know coca-cola commercials pepsi commercials frito-lay commercials you know mcdonald's commercials i'm loving it uh you know you have all of this conditioning going on that affects you at a very deep level that is preventing you from having the healthy life that you want so you need to deprogram your mind and understand that you know a, a 99 cent hamburger is not lunch yeah this is an important point it it has to do with the industrial food production in the industrial agriculture producing foods that that pretend to be nourishing you which then will be solved by industrial medicine which then will be um, funded by industrial health insurance. Well, it's not health, it's treatment insurance. Anyway, that whole system is now set up in such a way that it is like a viral disease, like a parasite that is slowly eating the society. And it's taking away money from all and sucking it all in and feeding itself. And it's curious because people who are working in it, I actually suspect most that are working within that system come there with goodwill and uh, love their children and love their spouses and, and do the best they can every day. And yet, unwittingly, they're serving this, this thing that essentially eats us all and sucking us all into itself. Well, that's the problem with the system, right? Everybody sees yes. a little bit of the picture. Nobody sees the big picture. And I'm just doing my job. I'm calling on the doctor. Or I'm making sure that he's subscribing this drug that my boss told me was great drug for this problem and this other problem and some other problem. And, oh, it's not approved for that problem, but it really works. And so, and so on and so on and so on. And it's, uh, it's what happens when you have a system in place that really serves – like. The thing that blew my mind was the president of one of these big pharmaceutical companies. He said, the goal of our company is everybody in North America takes our drugs every day. Yes, that's it. And it was, well, one of the big ones is this cholesterol reducing scheme that they have foisted upon us, which is one of the most criminal con jobs ever because you don't have a cholesterol problem nobody does and yet millions are treated for it millions right oh anyway so to uh, to get back to where i want to take this is this i hope the i hope that you the person that's listening to it right now are ready to wake up and take up this this mission. And the mission is to uh, take control of your life, own it, own the outcomes, 
and see it as something that you control, you will decide what's going to happen. And by taking into your grocery budget the things that make the food complete. Like this is an important distinction. We make some really special nutritional supplements. 150 years ago, you did not need supplements. You only needed nutrition. But because the industrial nutrition is so deficient, we now need to supplement it with the that which is missing from it. And we do understand it. We put it together and serve it to you. When you get on those, you will dramatically improve the long-term outcomes. Right. And the other thing I want to say is the stuff that we don't uh, manufacture ourselves, we have a very personal relationship with the manufacturers. So, you know, a lot of people are geniuses at creating stuff that can impact your health, but they're very, because they're a genius in area A, they're not normally very good in area B, which is getting it out into the world, which Martin is a genius at. And so they come to him and they say, help us. So Martin just doesn't say, okay, he has a very rigorous process that he puts these people through and he knows who they are and he knows how they do what they do. And that's how they get onto the Life Enthusiast website. It's not just a group of stuff that we think maybe somebody might want to buy one day. It's, these are things that we really strongly believe in and we know that they can impact people's lives in a very positive way. Yeah, this is an important point. Um... The small businesses, usually still run by the founders, tend to be driven by passion for something like the enzymes or the superfoods or the whatever, something that is really important. And quality is baked in. Yeah, because they can't do it. They, can only, they can't do it at a subpar level. It's not in their DNA. It's amazing. And you can, by the way, you can meet these people if you go to our, if you go to the website, www.life-enthusiast.com, click on the YouTube button or you go to YouTube and find our channel. We interview a lot of these manufacturers and you can see for yourself, you know, their passion, their concern, their caring, their, uh, their commitment to quality. It's all there. Yeah, they usually aren't slick performers. I'll no, tell you. no, they are not snake oil salesmen by any stretch of the imagination because they have they don't have a salesy bone in their body half of them so the point is that uh, when a company grows too much and is sold to the investor who doesn't care about the business they only care about the bottom line the the mentality switches from passion to spreadsheet yes and then it starts to uh, the question is asked not how can you make the most positive difference in a person's life but how can you still sell this while squeezing the least or squeezing the most cost out of this right how far can you dial it back so it still works yeah and you know a great example of that was walmart because they had a few years ago all these toys that had lead paint. And of course, what Walmart does is they tell the Chinese manufacturer, too much, too much, get the price down. And the poor guy is like, well, I can get this paint instead of that paint. And of course, the paint is lead based and it's cheaper. And then it comes to North America and kids start chewing on the paint. And then they realize that they're chewing on lead paint and it gets all recalled and it's a huge problem. And it all became from a demand for the least possible cost of the product possible with no consideration for quality. Indeed. And and the Chinese gets blamed for it when in fact it's the purchasing agent yes. that bought it that should be blamed. That's right. They'll they'll give you whatever you want. Yep, to the specifications that you want. Yeah. It's amazing. So interest, interestingly enough, it's a similar idea in the flooring business. I saw I saw a show, I think it was on Vice, where in Russia, in Siberia, national resources, forests, are being plundered. They are being cut down for the wood, like oak or whatever, cherry, I don't know what the trees are. 
Anyway, they're cutting down the trees in Siberia. They're hauling it by train to China, and they're low cost turning it into laminate flooring that is being soaked in toxic formaldehyde mm. because that's the cheapest of the glues that is usable. So there are standards that it's supposed to meet, and yet nobody's checking. This stuff is imported into uh, low-cost flooring sellers. And you go in there and you're thinking, oh, man, did I get myself a deal? Well, you have killed off the Siberian tigers. You have enriched the uh, Russian mafia, whatever they are. You have poisoned some Chinese workers that are slaving in these crazy factories. You have poisoned yourself and your children and your grandchildren because the toxins pass through multiple generations, all for that sweet deal that you just made on your flooring. And you killed your customers. <laughs> well, isn't that complicated? So stop the insanity. Someone else said when he talked about weight loss, but it applies here. You need to get off the rat race treadmill and you need to get going. And one of the things that we wanted to just quickly talk about is taking a moment to decide what type of life you want to live. You know, and then looking at your life and saying, okay, I'm here. I want to be here. What do I need to do to get from here to here? And then start making the commitment to taking the steps knowing that there's going to be challenges, knowing that there's going to be uncomfortable, knowing that you're going to have fear and anxiety pop up. and But it, knowing also that if you just stay here, you're going to be living a life of quiet desperation, as the majority of people are these days. And, and it's not serving you, and it's not serving your purpose, and it's certainly not serving the world. But unless we all make a change and start going towards what it is we do want, instead of just staying in our little comfort zone, uh, preparing for what we know is going to happen five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road, because we can see it happening to people that are that much older than us now. Uh, you, need to, you need to make the change, and it's only going to come from you. Uh, we can show you, we can help you, we can, we can coach you, we can show you some tools. We can say these are things that we know will really help you, but if you don't open the bottle and pop a few supplements, or if you don't decide that uh, five cents a pound is worth it for organic apples versus non-organic apples. Uh, you know, there's not a lot that anybody can do. Right. We need you on the train that understands that quality matters. And I need you to include the superfoods we make in your regular grocery budget. Yeah. Find the way. Because if you don't, you're going to pay the price later. I, I don't mean to sound gloomy, but that's how it goes. Yeah. And if you're wondering where to start, on the Life Enthusiast website, we have hundreds of articles. And you may say, well, I have back pain, or I have low energy, or I'm overweight, or I, I have fibromyalgia, or I have this, or I have a bad heart. You can start there and get all the information on that area, and then it'll start expanding your world, and you can start looking at other things. And you need to educate yourself. And watching our videos is helpful. Reading the articles is helpful. Calling Martin and, and asking him some questions and getting some help from him is, is also going to be helpful. And you need to move through this process. And you have to understand that you cannot do it alone. Left to our own devices, we're quite happy to sit and watch TV and eat pizzas, pop, and old Dutch chips. And uh, that's not really very helpful. <laughs> Go team. <laughs> Hooray, they won. Yeah, I mean, that's what, the, that's what the Roman Empire did. They built all these Colosseums and they put lions and Christians in them or they put gladiators in them so that the people wouldn't be thinking about what it was like at home. They'd be forgetting it, right? And of course, now we've got 200 channels of gladiatorial type stuff going on at all times to keep our minds off of what's really important. Oof. Well, <clears throat> there you have it. Change travels on the wavelength of gratitude. So if you want better than this, it starts with acknowledging what you already have, being grateful for what we have accomplished and how life has already taught us so much, being grateful for what we are learning every day, and then expanding on that. 
That's right. I'm. Uh, I invite you to give us a call. We um, we do have lots of answers and feel confident about them. So uh, find it at life-enthusiast.com, where we are restoring vitality to you and to the planet. The number is 866-543-3388. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We appreciate you. We're glad that you are coming along on this journey with us. We look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.